A spaceship falling into a black hole slows down. Yes, you heard me right. Black holes have so much gravitational pull that not even light has a chance to escape. But still, a spaceship would get slower and slower the closer it gets to the event horizon. To understand that, we have to do the calculations. But although we are in the realm of general relativity, we won't be needing more than basic calculus to understand the math. So no differential geometry. It's going to be easy. I promise. The video will be structured in three sections. First, we will work a bit through the theory of relativity. Then, we will learn about the Lagrange formalism, the most powerful way of doing physics. And the third step will be to apply the Lagrange formalism to a black hole. This way, we will find out why a spaceship radially falling towards the event horizon will slow down. Relativity is all about metrics. Whenever we talk about the physics of space-time, the term metrics will pop up. But what is a metric, actually? Metrics are used to measure distances in space. The most simple metric that we can think of is the Euclidean metric. Let's take a look at two-dimensional space with x and y coordinates. In this space, there are two points, p1 and p2. And the p1 point has the coordinate x1, y1, and the p2 point has the coordinate x2, y2. To get the distance between those two points, we would make use of the Pythagorean theorem. So the distance squared, which is d squared, would be x2 minus x1 in bracket squared plus y2 minus y1 in bracket squared. And this difference, we will call them delta x and delta y. So the metric of our Euclidean space is this squared distance, d squared. But what about space-time? How could we determine distances between two points in space-time? To do so, we are going to use another metric, the so-called Minkowski metric, named after Hermann Minkowski, a Russian-German mathematician who was the first one to discover the geometric nature of Einstein's special theory of relativity. This again helped Einstein later to further develop the theory of relativity and include gravity as a geometric feature of space-time. But back to measuring distances in space-time. Let's take a look at a two-dimensional space-time. For simplicity, we don't do four dimensions. We have the x-axis for space and the ct-axis for time, where ct stands for the speed of light multiplied with the time. This space-time coordinate system that we see here is called a Minkowski diagram, also named after Hermann Minkowski. Now let's take a look at two points and we will call them E1 and E2 in this Minkowski diagram, so in this two-dimensional space-time. Points in space-time, they are actually easy to interpret. Let's say a particle starts at the point x1 at the time t1 and it moves to the point x2 arriving there at the time t2. Each point corresponds to the particle popping up in specific location in space at a specific time t. This is our motivation to call points in space-time events. Each point in space-time is a literal event. And the distance between two events is measured with the Minkowski metric. And the Minkowski metric is d squared is equal to c squared times delta t squared minus delta x squared. Notice the minus sign between the time component and the space component of the metric. This is the major difference when comparing it to the Euclidean metric. And this is also why the physics of space-time is a bit weirder than our normal understanding of space itself without time. Now for completeness, we extend our definition of the Minkowski metric to four-dimensional space-time, which means we're just adding two extra spatial components, delta y and delta z, with minus signs. Of course, it's not always suitable to use Cartesian coordinates in physics. Another very popular way of approaching physical problems is by assuming a spherical geometry. Spherical coordinates will be useful a bit later in this video when we will be studying black holes themselves. So, how would the metric look like in curved spacetimes? Because so far we have only looked at the Minkowski metric for a flat spacetime. Well, for most cases, 
the metric would look like a modified Minkowski metric. The time and the space components each get a prefactor, which itself is dependent on the energy distribution that is curving space-time. So we have energy, which curves space-time, which changes the distances between events in space-time, and therefore changes each component of the Minkowski metric by multiplying them with a prefactor each. To determine those prefactors of the modified Minkowski metric, one has to solve the Einstein field equation. Let's take a quick look at how this equation works. As Einstein found out, energy is equal to mass, E equals mc squared. And he also found out that energy curves spacetime. Therefore, mass curves spacetime. But not only heavy masses like planets, stars, and black holes curve spacetime, Every type of energy curves space-time. Even a beam of light coming out of your phone curves space-time. How much a certain distribution of energy curves space-time is described by the Einstein field equation. On the right side of the equation we have the energy momentum tensor, which is just a mathematical object that describes the energy that is about to curve space-time. This tensor is multiplied with a scalar that involves the gravitational constant, the speed of light, and for some weird reason, the number pi. On the left side of the equation, we will find the Ricci curvature tensor and the Ricci curvature scalar, which once again are just mathematical objects that describe the curvature of spacetime due to the energy on the right side of the equation. The Ricci scalar is multiplied with the metric of the spacetime, g mu nu, which is the center of the whole equation. The solutions to the Einstein field equation are metrics, and those metrics describe how a certain type of energy, let it be a ray of light or a supermassive black hole, would change the distance between two events in spacetime. Solving the Einstein equation actually means solving multiple interconnected equations. This is a lot of work which we can luckily avoid. Nowadays it's mostly done by computer code, since one does not actually do physics while solving the equations. The real physics starts when we have the solution to the Einstein field equations, the metric. Then we can find out cool stuff about what's happening with space-time. One such metric is the Schwarzschild metric, which we will be working with later in the video. We will also learn why now suddenly the metric is giving in an infinitesimal form. But first, we have to work out how the metric, and therefore the distance between events, can help us understand the physics of space-time. To do so, we will be applying the most powerful mathematical formalism of all time. And it's super easy. The year is 1788. 100 years ago, Isaac Newton worked out his magnificent theory of gravitation and mechanics. Now the French mathematician Joseph-Louis Lagrange is about to develop the greatest mathematical formalism used in physics. Nowadays it is known as the Lagrange formalism. Lagrange managed to describe mechanical systems completely using only a simple scalar function, the so-called Lagrangian. From this Lagrangian he could deduce all important physical properties of a system. To be a bit less abstract, from the Lagrangian one can determine for example the energy or the momentum of a physical system. The crazy thing is, this not only works for mechanics, it works for electromagnetism, thermodynamics, the theory of relativity, quantum physics and modern particle physics. For every theory that has ever been developed. And there is actually a very simple way to determine the Lagrangian of a physical system. Let's take a look again at a two-dimensional space-time. For simplicity it should be flat, but the considerations work for curved space-time as well. Now let's say we have a particle moving from point x1 to point x2 and starting at point x1 at the time t1 and reaching point x2 at the time t2. The particle could take many paths. How can we determine the distance that a particle traveled on this wobbly line through space-time? we need to split up the wobbly line into a chain of infinitesimally small straight lines. Those straight lines have the infinitesimal length squared ds squared is equal to c times dt squared minus dx squared. 
with infinitesimal small time interval dt and infinitesimally small space interval dx. To get the length of the wobbly curve, we need to sum all the infinitesimally small elements up, which means we have to integrate over the infinitesimally small distance ds. Now, how is that related to getting the Lagrangian of a particle moving through space-time? Well, first we have to introduce a time dependence into this integral, so the ds turns into ds over dt times dt. Then we multiply the integral with the mass m of the particle and drag the mass m into the inside of the integral. This is called the Lagrangian of the particle and the integral s is called the action. The probably most important fundamental principle in all of physics is the principle of least action. This principle states that a particle always travels through space-time in such a way that the action is minimal, the shortest path through space-time, so to speak. By minimizing the integral above, one would get the shortest path through space-time and with it the equations of motion, but for the purpose of this video we won't be needing it. All we need is the Lagrangian, so let's take a look at it again. The Lagrangian is the time derivative of the space-time distance multiplied by its mass. This is why the metrics in general relativity are given in an infinitesimal small form. But how is the Lagrangian now used to do physics? Let's remember the beginning of this section. The Lagrangian is a scalar function to describe physical systems like our particle moving through space-time. With its help, we can determine important physical properties. And the most important property to know in order to describe the physics of anything is its energy. In general, the Lagrangian is dependent on the space-time coordinates and on the time derivatives of those space-time coordinates. To obtain the energy of our particle, we first have to multiply the time derivative of each single coordinate with the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to that time derivative. Then we sum those products up and in the end we just subtract the Lagrangian and this gives us the energy of the particle moving in space-time. Let's apply this to a real-life example. Do you remember the Schwarzschild metric that I briefly mentioned in the end of section 1? Now the time has come. We will determine the Lagrangian and then the energy of a particle moving in the gravitational influence of a black hole. In 1915, Karl Schwarzschild served as a German soldier during the First World War at the Russian front. In the same year, Einstein published his general theory of relativity, presenting his field equations and how energy, mass and curvature are related. But he also thought that the equations are impossible to solve. Well, Schwarzschild somehow got hand of Einstein's paper and he started thinking about how to solve the equations. One would have to simplify the problem. Let's think about a spherical object, with no rotation and no electrical charge, just a ball. Then the equations must be easy to solve. Well, yes and no. Deriving the Schwarzschild solution to the Einstein field equations requires a lot of concentrated shifting and manipulating of indices while taking the derivatives with respect to four different coordinates. And somehow, Karl Schwarzschild managed to do all of that while fighting at the front. And I cannot even concentrate on a WhatsApp message when there's too many people around. So, this exact solution of the Einstein equations for a ball of mass, or more professionally put, a spherical mass distribution, is nowadays known as the Schwarzschild solution. The metric of space-time around a spherical mass distribution is given in spherical coordinates. The peculiar part about the metric is the so-called Schwarzschild radius, which is defined as 2 times the mass m times the gravitational constant g divided by c squared. What is so peculiar about this Schwarzschild radius? Well, if a spherical mass distribution contains all its mass inside of the Schwarzschild radius, then we're talking about a black hole. We're aiming to write down the Lagrangian of a particle with mass m moving towards a black hole. So let's remember that the Lagrangian is the mass times the metric divided by the infinitesimal time. Since the Schwarzschild metric is given in squared form, we have to square the fraction and take the square root afterwards. So we have m times ds over dt is equal to m times the square root of ds over dt in the whole fraction squared. 
before plugging in the Schwarzschild metric, we are abbreviating a bit the Schwarzschild metric by introducing the parameter alpha, which is one minus two times G times M divided by C squared R. Now we can plug in the Schwarzschild metric and divide each component by DT squared, and we will get this very long square root. And since these are fractions of infinitesimal distances, we can work with them like with derivatives. And this is how we get the Lagrangian of a particle with mass m moving in the space-time outside of the event horizon of a black hole. Now, back to our original question. Finally, we want to know how it is possible that we observe the spaceship approaching the event horizon slower and slower with time. We can simplify the problem by assuming that the spaceship is radially falling towards the black hole, so following a straight line leading towards the center of the black hole. This means that neither the longitude angle phi nor the colatitude angle theta change with time, so phi dot is equal to zero and theta dot is equal to zero. This simplifies the Lagrangian a lot. Now the Lagrangian is m times the square root of alpha c squared minus r dot squared divided by alpha. We can see that the Lagrangian is only dependent on r dot and on r, where this r dependency is coming from the alpha parameter, which itself is dependent on the radius r. Let's use this simple Lagrangian now to determine the energy of the spaceship falling towards the event horizon. Let's recall the formula for the energy of a particle based on its Lagrangian for a moment. Luckily in our case, the Lagrangian is only dependent on one time derivative, on r dot, therefore we can drop the sum sign. Only r dot appears in the Lagrangian, not t dot, phi dot or theta dot. So for the energy, we first need the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to r dot. This is pretty simple, we just need to apply the chain rules. Since we are interested in the radial velocity of the spaceship, so r dot, we should get rid of the square root. So let's square both sides of the equation and we will get e squared is equal to m squared times alpha squared times c to the power of 4 divided by alpha c squared minus r dot squared divided by alpha. And what we're doing now is just rearrange some terms until we finally reach a formula for the radial velocity squared. We will omit the square root because we won't need it to understand the physics behind it. And we will get that the radial velocity squared is alpha squared c squared minus m squared times alpha cubed times c to the power of 4 divided by the energy of the particle or the spaceship squared. Now, let's remember our definition of alpha. Alpha has been 1 minus the fraction of the Schwarzschild radius and in the denominator the actual radius, the actual radial position of the particle of the spaceship. With Rs being the Schwarzschild radius, our formula for the radial velocity of the spaceship falling into the black hole turns into 1 minus rs divided by r squared in brackets times c squared minus the scalar m squared c to the power 4 divided by e squared times 1 minus rs divided by r in brackets to the power of 3. This might look complicated and you may think how the heck is this gonna help me, but hear me out. Take a look at the radius r. The closer it gets to the event horizon rs, the closer the fraction gets to 1. This means that the term in the brackets approaches zero as the spaceship is getting closer to the event horizon. 
And the same thing is happening for the second bracket. With R approaching RS, the brackets approach zero. So in summary, the whole radial velocity goes to zero as the spaceship approaches the event horizon. Does that mean that nothing ever enters a black hole? No, we just cannot observe anything entering a black hole. The spaceship itself experiences the crossing of the event horizon, it's just that we, as the observer, are not able to see that. Thank you so much for joining today's video. It would be amazing of you to leave a like, it will help me with the algorithm. A lot. If you want to know how to calculate the time from the spaceship's perspective, subscribe to my channel. Calculating this will be up soon on this channel. So long, my fellow path integrators. Bye!